I'm Steve Guggenheim, and this is Travel with Googs. Before we had kids, we visited the Grand Canyon and discovered a world that until then was foreign to us. You can't go without being overwhelmed by the beauty, the size, the color, the amazing offerings of our national park system. Fast forward, we had twin boys and decided it was time to take them to the Grand Canyon. They were eight years old, but how to get there from New Jersey? We didn't have the money to fly four people to Arizona and didn't have the time to drive out west. One night, while pondering the problem, I decided to call Amtrak. I lucked out with a reservation specialist. She was all excited when I told her what I wanted to do. It turns out she had taken the same trip with her family. Four hours later, I got off the phone with everything planned. She arranged for us to go from Penn Station in New York across the middle of the country to Albuquerque and returning through the northern state so we could see a different part of our vast nation while sitting in the comfort of our train seat. She told us what to bring and how to arrange everything. One Saturday, we went to Penn Station. We were on the platform waiting for the train to be announced. As she told me what to do, I scrambled onto the train and got seats for the four of us facing each other. Otherwise, they would have been one in front of the other or across the aisle since there are no assigned seats. Another of her suggestions, bring a suitcase filled with toys, books, and games. The idea of sleeping in the train seat was not the most appealing but a lot more affordable than a sleeper car. We headed out of the Big Apple for our big adventure. We ate in the dining car, which was quite pleasant, but really couldn't see anything since it was nighttime. We arrived in Chicago early Sunday morning with plans for the next leg of the trip that night. I wanted to split the trip for several reasons. One, to get a break from the train, and two, to visit the Museum of Science and Industry, which I had heard was very interesting. We walked through the city, and over to Lake Michigan, which is quite beautiful on a summer Sunday morning. It turns out that we're having a yearly festival called A Taste of Chicago. After walking around for a while, we took a cab to the museum, which was as good as advertised. We eventually headed back to the train station for our 6.30 p.m. boarding and managed to see a number of sights on the way. Breaking up the trip added to the overall experience. We again had our facing seats for the trip that would land us in Albuquerque a day and a half later. While the trip to Chicago was quiet, the ride from there was a party. A group of Westerners got on the train and everyone was in a celebratory mood. We talked, ate, sang, and generally had a good time. People in the sleeper cars wandered out wanting to take part in the fun, saying it's boring with nothing to do in their car. I may not have had the money to get a sleeper, but our coach seats turned out to be the best way to travel. Tuesday morning, we landed in Albuquerque, took a cab to the RV facility, and picked up the 28-foot motorhome we had reserved. You're in for an awakening if you've never driven a vehicle that size. It's a lot bigger than a minivan, takes a lot more room to make a turn, and doesn't do well on narrow roads. I was amazed the first time I stopped for gas. It's like filling an elephant. And the dipstick to check the oil seems as long as the vehicle. Inside, the appointments were nice and roomy. Comfortable beds, a shower, a nice place to eat. The first day, we took a cable car up to Sandia Peak, a ski resort in Albuquerque. Within a half-mile hike, I was winded. What a difference the altitude makes. You need to get in shape if you plan on hiking. The next time I traveled to the southwest, I was fine because months earlier, I walked all over with a backpack filled with two gallons of water. I carried the backpack on nightly walks in my neighborhood and three days a week went up and down a hill for an hour. I was in the best cardiovascular shape I've ever been in. The plan was to travel back and forth between Arizona and New Mexico, seeing the Grand Canyon, Santa Fe, a rodeo in Prescott, the Petrified Forest, and the cliff dwellings, among other sites. The first night we stopped in an organized campground, which I hated. It was like staying in a regular motel except you sleep in your RV. They have all kinds of amenities, and it's the furthest thing from camping that I can imagine. The next night, the same thing. After that, the trip improved dramatically as we found beautiful campsites. We bought a campground guide, finding places to stay with soaring mountains and breathtaking scenery. And we discovered there's a whole world out there we never knew existed. One park had showers, which my wife took advantage of. A bunch of Native American children came down from the mountain. She said it was as if they had never showered before. They giggled, danced, and sang as the water spilled onto them. It was one of the highlights of the trip for her. There's nothing wrong with organized campgrounds, and thousands love them. 
But one thing I enjoy about traveling is getting out of your comfort zone. We see the famous tourist sites, but also like to go off the beaten path. We found a campground in New Mexico that we wanted to stay at. By the way, we never made any reservations on this trip, but couldn't find it. I finally saw a police car and stopped to ask for directions. He said it was about 10 miles down the road and insisted he take us there. That bowled us over. He took us to the site and left us on our own. That was a mistake. I drove the 28-foot behemoth down a narrow, overgrown path until we got to the end. No sign of any campground. Do you know what a three-point turn is to turn around? Well, there is now a 100-point turn. While driving back, all of a sudden we hear this noise from the top of the RV from the overhanging branches. I couldn't get to the top of the vehicle, and it turns out we lost the refrigeration cover. Finally, I see a tiny campground sign. As I turned in, I heard this screeching from a large rock I hadn't seen. That noise? We crushed the steps and for the rest of the trip had to jump in and out of the RV. There were only a handful of RV sites and we parked in one, changing into our bathing suits and heading to the watering hole. It was beautiful. Not only that, there was a hanging vine which we used to swing over and drop into the water. That was something I had wanted to do ever since I was a kid watching Tarzan movies. It's not something you find if you don't get off the beaten path. The following day, July 4th, we headed to Prescott, Arizona for the longest running rodeo in the country. We kept screwing up the time, not realizing the time zone is different in the two states. As a result, we arrived early. We searched for a gas station and I borrowed a crowbar hoping to fix the stairs, but to no avail. Oh well. The July 4th celebration in downtown Prescott was a lot of fun. Old time fireworks in a race, games and overall just a great time. I imagine other small towns have similar celebrations, but this made me imagine how holidays like this were celebrated a long time ago. A small downtown and the people out to have a good patriotic time. Then it was time for the rodeo. If you've never gone to one, you need to put it on your list. Roping and riding and racing, great horsemanship, lassoing, cotton candy, hot dogs, and an all-around good time. We finally made it to the Grand Canyon. It was just as amazing and beautiful as it was on our first trip. Most people visit the South Rim, and that's where we parked the RV. If you go, pick out three places along the rim and take pictures at the same place in the morning, afternoon, and evening. The sun shines differently on each spot, and at the end of the day, you'll have nine different pictures, absolutely breathtaking. One afternoon, I decided to go on a short hike down the canyon, the trail being very narrow and windy. I bought a canteen and was hiking when I saw an alcove along the path where I could get out of the sun, which was scorching. No sooner had I pulled into the shaded spot that a mountain goat passed right in front of me. Now that's enough to wake you up. I was stunned to see the animal. He was so close I could have touched him. A final note before I move on from the Grand Canyon. No matter how hard I tried, I could not fill up the water needed for the RV. Turns out I had damaged something while on that narrow path in the previous campground. To this day, I have no idea what I did. Another highlight of the trip was Santa Fe. It's beautiful with adobe buildings everywhere you look. Quaint shops, restaurants, art museums dot the landscape. I fell in love with southwestern art. The only problem we encountered were the narrow streets. I didn't see any signs that RVs are too big for the roads. Instead, I suffered as I drove the mammoth vehicle through town. One of the most amazing things seen on the trip were the cliff dwellings. In ancient times, Native Americans, to protect themselves from attack, built their homes and villages in the middle of a cliff. It's an astounding feat of engineering. Just imagine that in the middle of a mountain, hundreds of feet up, they carved out a space to live. Driving through Red Rock Canyon was another treat. There are many other sites to see while in Arizona and New Mexico, so it's a good idea to try and map out where you want to go instead of just going out there haphazardly. After 10 days on the road, it was time to turn the RV back in, and I was in a panic. Because of all the damage, I thought I would be in debt for the rest of my life. But without realizing it, I was okay. It turns out insurance was built into the price, or at least I hadn't realized it. What a relief. The trip back by train was relaxing. The route was not as scenic, but was fine. We were tired and didn't have that excitement at the beginning of the trip, but we met a lot of nice people. The nicest were those returning from Fillmore Scouting's High Adventure Camp in New Mexico. We hung with the parents while the older kids took our twins under their wing. 
Several times I figured I'd rescue the older scouts, figuring they were tired of dealing with little kids. But after 10 days together, they were thrilled to have someone else to talk to, even if they were younger. And they pleaded with me not to take them away. A lifetime experience for my kids. Traveling by RV has its good and bad points. It's great to have a bathroom in your vehicle when traveling with small kids, and you don't have to search for food since you're basically driving a house. You can also find beautiful campgrounds to stay in, and you don't have to set up a tent every night and unpack your suitcase. Motels are not as prevalent in some areas of the country, so you always have a place to stay. I haven't compared the price to a rental car, eating out all of the time, a motel every night, etc., but I imagine it measures favorably. But there are some negatives. They are cumbersome to drive, and there are certain roads you can't travel on since you're so big. It still bothers me I couldn't go to certain places because of that. And they can be dangerous to drive. Someone cut me off on a windy road, and I thank my lucky stars we didn't flip over. We actually had several close encounters. The trip remains one of the best we ever took as a family, and I highly recommend it. We saw a lot of sights without spending a fortune, bonded as a family, saw a large portion of the country, one of the most scenic areas that exists, and generally had a terrific time. It's something you should consider if you're heading out west. I'm Steve Guggenheim, and this is Travel with Googs.